My name's Genevieve Bell and you shouldn't ask me about SSD and storage, but you can ask me about anything to do with user experience. Hi, my name is Nigel Cook. You can ask me about software-defined infrastructure. My name is Al Fazio and you can ask me about memory technologies. My name is uh, Mark Doran and you can ask me about firmware code that ships as part of the platform. My name is Jeff Kashik. You can ask me about how operating systems, Windows in particular, and the internal architecture work together. My name is Ajay Bhatt. You can ask me about PCs, IO technologies, including USB, touch, pen, sensors. My name is David Blythe. You can ask me about graphics. My name is Hong Jian. You can ask me a question about media, quick circuit video, like that. My, my name is Stephen Jordan, and you can ask me about CPU, PCH, SOC, hardware. Uh, my name is Anil. Uh, you can ask me questions around Windows OS. Uh, my name is Mark Bohr. You can ask me questions about silicon process technology. My name is Carl Kempf. I obviously didn't get the memo without wearing the fellow shirt, which is why I'm in the penalty box. <laughs> Again, uh, I work in the internal decision science group, building decision support tools inside the company. So you can ask me about decision algorithms. So I'm on a total power trip now. I got 12 fellows to do as I said, and they all did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have a cheat sheet up here to kind of keep, uh, um, uh, keep you reminded. So we're ready to go. In order to ask a question, um, make yourself visible. Uh, don't ask your question until you have mic in hand. When you have mic in hand, please stand must and then ask. It. You must. All right. Okay. Just start on the front row. All right. There you go. For you. Should I give it to him before or after the question? <laughs> well, you better wait till after. Okay. Okay. This is really bad. <laughs> so, Knut, I'm Peter Glaskowski. You probably recall a couple of previous fellows' talks. I've asked you about the convergence of memory and storage. And you said, I hadn't really thought about that very much. Last year you said, I suppose I should give that some thought. <laughs> Intel is just getting ready to, sh to ship a product called 3D Crosspoint, which blows away that distinction entirely. And I'm wondering what you think about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's fantastic. <laughs> No, the, uh, the, the 3D crosspoint technology that, uh, that was uh, recently announced, and uh, Al might have a few things to share on it as well. Uh, I think it's really exciting that we have uh, basically a, a new memory hierarchy. And uh, as it was shown in um, uh, BK's keynote, it was actually shown as another layer in the memory hierarchy. And it has these really cool attributes where it's, it can be used both as memory and as storage. And it's probably the first time we've had like a fundamental new uh, layer in storage hierarchy with the new underlying memory technology serving it in a long time. But now, this is probably your space the most. We developed the technology just to make Knut think. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do that five years ago and apparently it didn't take. So it took a long, you're having better luck than dollars for. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, so uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, the way we do think about the technology is, uh, you know, it can come into, um, you know, as uh, Rob talked about last night in our, our tech session, you know, as a new technology, we're going to go into where the slots are, right? So as uh, initially storage, which you saw in BK's keynote with a uh, early prototype SSD, is a very fast SSD. Uh, you saw in the tech session last night, also Diane's mega session of bringing in um, as uh, Intel DIMMs uh, based on 3D crosspoint and using it as big memory. Also the fact that it has persistence that's in there. And I think that you know developers uh, can really do a lot of, to think about, well, what can you do with the concept of memory storage and uh, converged capability? And I, I think those are some interesting things out in the future um, that I hope a lot of you will kind of uh, uh, innovate on. Thanks. Okay, we've got someone in the back behind the pillow here. Hi, Kevin Kringle from Materials Research. Uh, this is to uh, Mark Moore. Um, Mark, can you give us an update in Moore's Law and where the uh, process nodes are going since the update of the 10 nanometer push-out? Uh, well, yes. Uh, 
14 nanometers is the technology that's in uh, volume production today. You've already seen uh, uh, products such as uh, Broadwell last year and Skylake this year, and of course a lot of uh, uh, presentations on Skylake uh, at this event. And uh, there'll be uh, more in the coming year or so. I think the, the next uh, key product after Skylake is uh, KB Lake. Uh, um, and then in uh, 2017, we, we expect to start uh, shipping uh, our first uh, 10 nanometer product, uh, Canon Lake. Uh, so for Intel, Moore's Law continues, if, that, if that's your question. Well, yeah, this is going from a two year to a two and a half year note. So in fact, that's because two and a half years are going to be continued. So for uh, 14 and 10, it's, it's true we are, are on about a two and a half year cadence. Uh, uh, we haven't yet uh, you know, decided or announced uh, what the expected uh, introduction date for the uh, 7 nanometer technology will be. All right, we've got one over in the corner. My question is about the uh, new storage technology. Uh, I'm looking to get more this um, from SSD type of uh, um, storage as um, my you know tablet is small and we want to use that and with a fast speed. So I'm curious uh, how does um, cross point technology going to be uh, employed in that type of space and uh, if this technology is Intel only or will be also available for other guys to uh, make a custom version. So if I uh, got the question right, it was, uh, there are two questions in there, so I get to choose. <laughs> uh, one was, uh, uh, will it be available, and it sounds like uh, handheld tablets, those sorts of, that sort of thing, the form factor, and then the second one is, uh, is this a technology that's an Intel only, or, you know, are other people going to use it? Um, right now, we're not discussing a lot of products, but you saw it announced uh, thus far was kind of uh, uh, the Optane SSD family line of uh, uh, based on 3D cross point of SSDs uh, in 2016 and also delivering of Intel DIMMs in 2016 for next generation Intel Xeon uh, uh, platforms. Um, I'm not saying what is or what's not in the future that you know as future products come out those will get announced in time. Uh, with regards to you know, the technology, this is uh, Intel and Micron uh, jointly developed, and uh, that's something that we're jointly producing the underlying media technology between the two companies. Okay, so for the next question, uh, raise your hand if you're asking a question to someone that hasn't had a question yet, okay? So, a non-3D cross-point question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about we, we try to get the guy in the middle of the yellow shirt? He's like almost inaccessible, which makes it a lot more fun. <laughs> All right, Hi, my name is Dan. Um, so some of the system on chips, maybe I don't totally understand the security thing, but it seems like the root level uh, boot has started to be encrypted and secured. Um, but I don't see that in the uh, PCH high-end chipsets. I mean, you have TPM, but you don't have like secure key, you don't have uh, um, encryption on the, on the boot itself, you can do like a hardware root level attack. Um, are there any plans to do anything about that in the upcoming chipsets? That may be partly BIOS and partly PCH related. Yeah, so at, at least from the firmware point of view, we're uh, pursuing a sort of strategy of defensive depth. So you've seen us spend a lot of energy on uh, secure boot in the UEFI context. Uh, to ensure that code between reset and the OS is uh, protected from uh, intrusion. Uh, we're going to continue to add technologies that are complementary to that. We've already made sure that uh, the TPM device works in concert with, with Secure Boot, and we have other ideas to further improve the armoring of, of that code and drive the root of trust as close as we can to the reset vector. And we do expect that the hardware guys will give us something uh, even before reset that they can uh, you know, attached to for uh, for that root of trust in the fullness of time, but that's more about chips, of course. Is there anybody that can talk about chips? I don't know. We forgot that. Guy. All right. Next question is the back half of the room. All right, as far back as you go. Okay, very back row. Okay, Scott. 
stand up. Make these guys work a little bit. So this is probably more for Genevieve. Um, <laughs> well, nobody's asked you a question yet. So we, you're, you're talking a lot about using your technology to make life better for people and to extend the experience and, and all that good stuff from the keynote. What, as a corporate strategy officer, what's Intel going to do to break down the financial barriers that exist and allow that technology and allow those improvements to be extended to the masses so that it's not a, a, something that facilitates a creation of haves and have nots? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Intel's had a long-standing commitment to making technology available as broadly as possible and has a series of partnerships and collaborations on a global scale to ensure that there are ways that the technology can get into as many hands as possible. I think part and parcel of that, there's also a long-standing commitment to education so that you actually have the next cohort both of inventors and innovators but also of people who will be using the technology have it in their hands. If you look across our platform sort of line of technologies, you see them ranging across multiple price points and across multiple form factors that are really designed to be in as many hands as possible. And I think if you look at the statistics on technology adoption and use over the last decade, you would see a remarkable transformation in terms of who has the technology and how far it has spread. I think it's also important to remember that some of the have-nots are here, not elsewhere. We sometimes talk about that like it's a problem of other and elsewhere. But I think you know there's a strong commitment inside the US too from our executive leadership team, particularly from Brian, to think about how you bridge some of those gaps. So for me, it's you know multiple pieces, right? It's about the technology, but it's also about how do you partner in communities and how do you think about empowering people to be producers, not just consumers. All right, this criteria game is kind of fun to play. <clears throat> Next person who gets to ask a question is, if you were a previous Intel employee and you're sitting on the front row and you want to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> you <gotta> stand up. <laughs> stand up. Uh, this is again for Al. <laughs> oh, I forgot to have that, that, that last criteria. Okay, go ahead. Or I can ask Mark if you want. He, he can ask your questions. Uh, uh, Al, you've been working on PCM for a long time. Uh, when I look at the 3D Crosspoint, the, the, the Crosspoint is a way of just accessing where the storage is. Is the basic storage mechanism still phase change in the material? We're not disclosing what the uh, uh, underlying technology is, other than it's a uh, bulk resistive change mechanism. People can speculate what they like. Thus far, I can say all the speculation is not quite accurate. That's out there, and we're not disclosing what the underlying mechanism is. Thanks. Uh, all right. How about Jim? <laughs> Any man named Jim or a particular Jim? <laughs> yeah, all, all the Jims in the room stand up. <laughs> I'm a memory guy, and so I always ask memory questions, and I decided, in respect to Knut and what he's trying to do, I'd ask something that had absolutely nothing to do with memory. So, something I find very fascinating is light field imaging, where you have gobs of sensors, and you put them together to synthesize different kinds of, you know, focus or, you know, aperture, that kind of stuff. Isn't Intel doing anything with that of, you know, taking more than two or three sensors, but maybe taking 16 or a dozen, or, you know, a couple of dozen sensors and, and putting them together? What, how does that look with your graphics roadmap? Anyone? Yeah, I can try. Yeah, I'm gonna try. It's a definitely interesting uh, question, and also uh, it's uh, along the same direction. Quite of uh, image technologies are growing. Uh, well, for example, one of the technology we have is the, in the real sense technology. Some of the technology use a multiple camera to get the depth information there, and we do have people in the research lab doing uh, research with a multiple camera sensor, put a six, nine, even twelve uh, sensor out there to improve the resolution, also deliver better access of the depth information into the field. Right? So it's a clearly a uh, very active research field that uh, we would like to see some uh, uh, real application in this, uh, coming out from there. There is some of the research we found out that uh, 
when you have enough number of sensors, I think more may not deliver more information. So uh, there is an uh, upper bound about uh, uh, information can gather. Uh, that's uh, also research into that space as well. Definitely apply more than one, give you a uh, uh, sense that uh, closer to human uh, or animal uh, uh, data acquisition process. Yes. Okay, how about the one from the front left corner? Uh, hi, my question is about uh, Intel's plans around broadband mobility. Could somebody speak to kind of your strategy there and how you look to differentiate what you're doing in that space against other players out there? Broadband mobility. I'm not sure we have that represented here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't have the right guy to answer for you. So, uh, there's a session on it? Okay, is it done? I guess there was a session. There was a mega session on the 5G, so is that a uh, topic? Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can play the criteria game again. I don't think we've had any ladies ask a question yet. Do we have any ladies want to ask a question? Okay, the most vigorous arm first, and then... <laughs> <laughs> so, one and two. How's that? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do one, two. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um... My name is Aubrey Schick, and I guess this is more of a, a user experience question. Um, so with all of this speed and uh, data capability, um, how is this kind of affecting uh, the users, we'll say like socially and emotionally? Like, so now I, I can have access to everything I've ever done all at once, and, and how is that affecting culture? Yeah. You never get to ask these questions, it's so sad. Um, so listen, I, mean, I think there's a couple of things going on there, right? One is that we're coming out of a fairly intense period of hyper-connectivity, and it's very clear that many users in many parts of the world have been living online in a lot of ways that were unprecedented. What's also pretty clear as we start to track usage statistics is that some of that kind of hyper-connectivity is starting to wane a little bit. So we're moving into a period that's a little more um, measured and balanced, I would think, which is sort of what happens over an adoption cycle. Uh, we just finished doing some ethnographic work at Intel, so user studies, looking at uh, early adopters who were choosing to disconnect and the ways in which they were engaging in that and how those kind of habits were being supported both in a household level, so in really pragmatic stuff. Do you take your mobile phone into the bedroom? Are you taking your laptops on vacations? I'm sure all of you do, many people do not. Um, you know, are you logging off on weekends? And we started to see people doing that. If you were here in Silicon Valley, there was this amazing set of summer camps for grown-ups this summer, where it was a three-day experience and basically you turned up and you had your cell phone confiscated. There was no Wi-Fi, there was no internet, and there appeared to be an abundance of tool, power tool based activities and drinking games. <laughs> and they were routinely sold out. <laughs> There's sort of something in there about how do we reteach ourselves to have a life that isn't constantly connected. But when we look at the usage data, we see this sort of interesting blend now of more of a willingness to think about physical objects, hence I think the resurgence of making, but also a little bit more disconnecting. My name is uh, Janet Rampison. It's uh, somewhat of a futuristic question for you to meet. Uh, <coughs> next year, are we likely to see someone from Altera sitting up there? And is that person likely to be part of your platform engineering group? Hmm. I'm not sure I'm the uh, best equipped to, uh, to answer that question. And I don't think I. Even if I could answer it, I don't think I could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so live, uncensored, but occasionally silent. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as to how to address that. Um, Come back next year. Yeah. <laughs> Come back and find out. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, the guy in the back in the blue shirt has been very patient. Thank you. Oh no, red badge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Scott Watson. Uh, my question is for David. Um, will Intel support the VESA adaptive sync standard for variable refresh displays? And if so, when will we see it enabled in products? 
Fortunately, that was a two-part question. <laughs> and so I'll answer the first part, which is, you know, yeah, I think standards, you know, that we, we love standards, that we'll do everything that we can to go support them. So yes, if uh, adaptive sync is part of the basic standard, it's optional right now, we'll look into supporting it as, as soon as we can. But I can't announce anything about when it might be available. It just wouldn't be right if you didn't ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, we must preserve our tradition. Right? Yes. Uh, David Cantor, so uh, this is, I'm not quite sure who it goes to, but one of the things that we've seen over the last few years is the processor is usurping uh, OS functionality like uh, PSAFE management and uh, power gating and so forth. So what are sort of the next functions of the OS that you might want to suck into the hardware? better performance or power. That might be. Go ahead. I can take a stab at that. So I would not necessarily say that <clears throat> we are in the process looking at opportunities to suck things into the processor. We are always trying to figure out where the road belongs, who is in the best position to do that. So there are things that software is in much better position to do. It has the right context, right knowledge that processor would never have. On the other hand, there are things that software may be doing today which could be easily offloaded to the hardware, right? And uh, it could be done more energy efficiently, for example, uh, but and software did not really have a particular value to add there. So we always try to look for those boundary conditions and look for where the road really belongs and what's the real value proposition over there. And if there's a, and it is not just to be done for the sake of doing it, there has to be value associated with that. Uh, so if you uh, attended previous discussions around Skydig, uh, there was discussion around Intel speed shift technology. So that was a perfect example where OS knows about certain things, it provides those hints to the processor or the SOC, and the SOC is good at doing certain things, react more fast, um, and that's where uh, it's doing its job. So it's more of that, that we are constantly looking for opportunities to optimize for. And in general, I can also say that for the uh, the functionality that I work on, the programs that uh, that I'm involved in, that I integrate into our SSDs, that the word "suck" is usually not one of the common words that I associate with that activity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add to that. It's um, and actually looking at the last year, it's we found a lot of and just if you look at Windows 10 and Skylake, but I in general. Compared to previous generations, we've actually found a lot more opportunity to where a capability in the hardware and a capability in the software can actually come together and deliver a lot more value. And within that, it is identifying which function the hardware aspect can do better and which the software can do better. Right. And this piece of information that you will never be able to get in the hardware because there's a high level aspect of social P state policies is likely one. So it's really that tight handshake and defining that roles and responsibilities and bringing the two together to very collectively get a better solution is where we're the focus on. What about like thread to core scheduling? Scheduling is actually a classic example for that, right? Where um, we've in Windows worked very closely with Microsoft on SMT scheduling. Uh, there's a whole class of workloads that over a period of time and optimize very well to where the knowledge of how threads are mapped to cores, cores are mapped to packages, the sharing of the caches between them. A lot of that information you can expose to the operating system and have it be more sophisticated, a lot more intelligent in going ahead and knowing the nature of the workload. There might be a point in time when some of those decisions need to be made a granularity that it makes sense to be done at a lower level. But then at the end of the day, it has to be a higher value proposition collectively. All right, next question. Does anyone have a question for Nigel? All right, right here in the middle. This is a cloud question. Who's your microphone? Wow. This, this is about a, uh, the, the usage of the cloud. Now, when I plug in a USB drive into a Macintosh or a PC or a, many other devices, it knows what file system is on the USB drive, and it usually shows me the directory, and then I can decide what to do with it. I would like to do the same with the cloud. There are some technologies that let you do that, but still you typically have to log in and each cloud host has its own way of downloading files and moving things around it. So it's very, very different. So I get confused when I go to one side and then to the other side, try to do things the same way. You see a standard coming out to make that simple. That's a great question. Um, 
And, and, I, and part of the question, I think, is, is we we'll come back to the definition of cloud um, and, and how cloud is presented to people. So, generally in cloud, there is a move to standardize the APIs. There's an open source movement and, um, you know, most characterized by OpenStack. And so this is a community effort to make the, the APIs that you use to interact with cloud and relate to cloud components talk to each other, happen in a way that um, is, is sort of end and neutral. Um, and so I think that's, a, that's a, an aspect of standardizing how you interact with the cloud. That, I think, though, is very different sort of user interface level than, you know, PC level, um, sort of USB drive and, and, and sort of user interactions with the, within cloud services. And I think that the cloud services part is, is a place where um, there is um, sort of evolution for now, I think it's early days. Um, I think that there are um, a sets of services that are becoming very popular, but I think the next phase to, to meet the, the very requirement to talk about is going to be those services starting to standardize. Now, some of it is happening, but they're, they're very high level services, but I, th I think what you call out for, um, you know, people to be able to easily access and move components between, you know, different clouds, that's coming. But it's still one thing. All right, uh, let's see if we can keep this uh, criteria game going. Um, if someone traveled internationally and is just dying to ask a question before they travel home, <laughs> any of those? <laughs> oh, no, 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 if someone traveled internationally to get here. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, none of those, all right. Similar to. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm actually kind of surprised. Still I think I have one over here. All right, go for it. Uh, yeah, I'm from Romania. Yeah, All right. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, so I'm Octavian. Um, my uh, question is for the guys working with Windows. Um, Microsoft boasts his security in the latest Windows 10. You guys boast your security on the Skylake. Uh, if I were to believe that 100% from both companies, I'd say the Skylake and Windows 10 make the, the perfect partners regarding security. Does that mean that a system running on both these platforms is basically uh, unbreakable by hackers? And does it eliminate the need for a third party uh, security app? I'm trying to figure out this is a two part or three part question. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can choose. I'll actually give a pretty generic answer, right? Is, um, and I'll use a Fort Knox analogy because I've heard that. You can make something extremely secure, but then you can't go in and out of it, right? So security is only as good as um, the last attack that you know. Right? There's a whole set of infrastructure that you can build. So the focus that we have, right? I'm not going to say that there's a class of attacks that we don't know of that are not addressed. There's a lot of focus done where you know that, okay, here's something that can be done. And the infrastructure, right, collectively, a lot of smart people at Microsoft, it's a lot of smart people at Intel, have figured out the most effective mechanism for going in and addressing those. Right, so I think is, um, there's a whole set of capabilities There's a talk yesterday. Um, we can walk through where, whether it's a ring zero attack, whether it's a hash, uh, past the hash attack. So everything that, our buffer overflow attack, right. For each of those where we know this is a mechanism that's gonna use, and we're using um, really smart capabilities in Windows, associated with where if it makes sense, capabilities in the Intel architecture. We're building robust solutions to address that. All right, this next one's a freebie. Whoever makes themselves the most visible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> okay, how about over there in the corner by the speaker? Well, I think you did that for Joe. Oh, no. <laughs> no? So, according to Isaac Asimov, by now, we will have robots, robots here and maybe in outer worlds. So, what is really hampering the robot evolution? I've been waiting for it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we have anybody here for that. Listen, I'm happy to talk about the robot revolution <laughs> with anyone. Um, I, you know, 
you know, part of the thing about science fiction is that it's as much about the moment in which it was written as about the moment in which it is imagined, right? And part of what Asimov was working through was the technological ensemble he had at the time. Now, the fact that he's made some really good calls doesn't necessarily mean he is, in fact, an accurate predictor of the entire universe. That said, there is an extraordinary infrastructure of robots, it's just they're not the really sexy ones. I mean, there are 10 million Roombas running around the floors of this world. Now, that doesn't mean if the robot apocalypse is coming, it's at ankle height. And it's mostly concerned with dirt. Um, and it probably doesn't need to have the three laws of the robot in quite the way he imagined. But I think it's misplaced to think that there has not been an extraordinary influx of robotic technologies across multiple domains of human existence, running from robotic activity in factories to human factory interactions to things that are in our homes that look remarkably like a robot. So long as you imagine a robot is an algorithm with some kind of material cover on it, it doesn't need to look like a fully fledged deciding human being for it to be compelling and interesting. Okay, same rule applies. Make yourself visible. Two hands up, it's got to win. Oh. Sorry, two beats one. <laughs> but I'll get you. <laughs> so, uh, well, so the uh, uh, information data, this is, uh, I think, Nigel's uh, question. When, when you go to uh, uh, look at geo geographies, Germany, different things like that, uh, where does Intel see that they play in, in the, uh, the space of geotagging of data, making sure that it stays in, in the country, that kind of stuff um, for, for the cloud environment? Or, if you don't want to answer that, um, technology singularity theory, do you think it's actually like going to play out on, on making Moore's Law faster? So, uh, whichever fun you want to have. So, 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 so I'll do the geotagging one because it's, it's simple. There's actually, um, there's actually products we have that address that. There's um, code that has been, um, that, that leverages the trusted compute modules. There's um, code that's also been upstreamed into OpenStack that, that takes advantage of that to, um, to enforce the, 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 the geolocation sort of compliance requirements around um, uh, running workloads and, and accessing data. Um, and you know, that's also extending uh, with, a, with an Intel security product that allows um, the, 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 the owner of the data to keep the keys. And so um, the cloud provider can have the data, but it's encrypted. And the only person who has the keys is the owner. And so what that means from a, um, a European compliance point of view is that the encrypted data is actually allowed to leave the border because the, it's only the owner who has the keys and, and that remains within their, um, within, those, within those boundaries. Is that SGX? Um, it's not SGX, but SGX can be part of the solution that, that lets you securely give the key to the, um, uh, the chosen server to, to, to decrypt it and be sure that in, in, in sort of temporarily passing over the keys to the kingdom, um, you, you sort of don't give away the farm. That merged about three metaphors there. But um, it, it, it's part of the solution, but, but it's not the whole solution. Okay, the gentleman on the side here has been very patient. Newton, I have one real, real quick one right back here. Right. Uh, one question, two sides. It's an open question and it doesn't want to be hypothetical. Um, given the level of experience with new technologies and high technologies, I'm curious as to what new technologies are, that you can speak about really excite you, and conversely, which technologies make you the most concerned about what's emerging in, in the marketplace nowadays? Uh, is your question kind of directed at someone? Because you can probably get at least 12 different answers on that, right? Well, it's, it's an open question for anybody who wanted to take it. Well, but whoever has it spoken the most, I guess. <laughs> I'll give you one that I'm excited about. Uh, okay. I'm really looking forward to flexible displays. Uh, the idea of having a, uh, the amount of compute that we have now in very small packages is great, but my cell phone is uh, increasingly difficult for me to deal with because my eyes are just going back because I'm getting old. <laughs> so the idea of being able to carry around a, 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 something that is uh, large enough for me to actually have a sort of desktop style of visual experience but fits in my pocket. That's what I'm really looking forward to. That's going to be the form factor of choice for me as I, uh, as I look for the next generation of devices. I'm a storage guy. I'm really excited about Al's technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't think about it. 
Anyone else have uh, something that uh, really um, uh, fires you up? Mark, are you excited about EUV? <laughs> Absolutely. Almost as excited. Absolutely. Almost as excited as I am about the crosspoint memory. <laughs> <laughs> and silicon germanium. All right. The gentleman there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You've already got the mic. Go for it. <laughs> You're starting to wonder how many times I can skip you, huh? <laughs> Well, I'm not female, and I'm not in the front row, and I'm not ex-intel, so... <laughs> Don't meet any criteria. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, we're working on communication stuff, and we're running 100 gig into one of your um, Xeon, your latest Xeon V3s. And what we found now is your processors are so fast, your memory isn't keeping up, and the DDR4 um, is now heavily affected with the Chasm RAS, and we can't do 100 gig in and out twice into the memory. Um, so, does your new cross point reduce the chasm RAS, or um, is there any thought of any new technology in the processors or anywhere that will redress this balance where the processors are now extremely outperforming the memory? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that the, the underlying question, uh, we probably need a server platform guy. Uh, a secondary part of your question, I think, uh, Alan, I probably can answer. Uh, you mentioned that the, the DDR4 DRAM isn't fast enough for your application. And uh, the 3D crosspoint technology, I don't think that our expectation is that it be faster than DRAM. And I think in the material that we showed, we showed that it is Slower. much, much faster than the layer in the memory hierarchy below DRAM. And it's far cheaper than DRAM. Yeah, and unfortunately, I, I don't have that specifics, but uh, I don't think that our thinking has been that we're expecting it to be faster in practice, even, um, than uh, the main main use. But we're expecting it to be far cheaper and far bigger. Uh, and so uh, it has other attributes that are interesting, not to mention the novel alternative. Okay, uh, another question. I, I tend to kind of concentrate on who I see up front, and so let's do the back half of the room. How about in that back corner, the lady with her hand up there? Yes, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, for whomever. What happened to transactional memory? Two years ago, everything was TSX and how much scalability and work. performance we can get, and now it's radio cycles. What happened? Did the vision change? What is your thoughts on scalability? Are we stuck with lots? It doesn't work. I don't think we have actually a memory guy here. Uh, Does it work? Do you have something? No. No? You need a cash architect. Yeah. All right. You, you probably should get like two cards for stumping the chump. Because <laughs> um, uh, we, we don't have someone here that could actually take that on directly. I gave her another one. Yeah. All right. Don't try to like go for that now in the future. <laughs> you know? Sometimes you've got to be careful what behavior you reward. How about the uh, gentleman in the back near the camera? Blue, uh, blue shirt. Yeah. Stand. Hi there. I'm afraid this is uh, another Optane question. Um, I was wondering, do you predict it will replace uh, NAND and I suppose hard drives as well uh, in the in the future? And if not, what will be the circumstances under which hard drives or NAND will still be the preferred memory choice? So if you take a look at uh, where we're focusing Optane versus NAND, NAND, particularly 3D NAND, which is a, uh, extremely uh, low cost per bit and drives in that direction, is kind of the lowest cost per bit where cost is most sensitive and it's good enough performance. And as you drive that cost down, you can start thinking about um, that SSDs start going further and further into where hard drives are today. Hard drives kind of got pushed out of the 
Um, you have a hot uh, tiering of data centers going into kind of warm and, and cold. You can start thinking about NAND driving further into that and getting more pervasive through through laptops. It, you have to remember that in terms of uh, attach rates for SSDs, it's probably around 20% right now. And so Whereas on the other side, Optane is going to be going after the highest performance segment. And that's both, you know, uh, if you went to uh, uh, Kurt and Doug's mega session, Chris Roberts talked about uh, gaming uh, and how it will um, uh, revolutionize capabilities in gaming. Similarly, in data center, if you think about transactional uh, type of performance. So you should be thinking about an Optane on a, on a high performance SSD for storage. You should be thinking about uh, NAND, particularly 3D and NAND driving into the lowest cost per bit at good enough performance. What you said, I agree. So. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, let's get one more in the, in the back. Um, Mike Renner's choice. Thank you. Um, this is for Genevieve, actually, on uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, it's a technology that kind of fits and starts. And it's a lot of debate about it. Mark Zuckerberg's been out there saying that it's the next platform or even the final platform. What's your view on the actual eventual adoption of that technology when it happens? And what's your kind of take on the hurdles for adoption? You know, bad time covers with standing. Yeah, I mean, so you're not wrong about the length of time, right? The first augmented reality demo was the sort of Damocles, and it was 50 years ago. So we've been playing with this technology for a long time, right? I think we're finally at a moment where the technology can deliver on the promise of the experience, that you can actually have a fully immersive, engaging, utterly transforming experience. Now, there are some challenges. Uh, it creates bad visual effects for a surprising number of people. It induces everything from nausea to fainting to all points in between. It's certainly in its full sort of occlusion headsets. It's very alienating from everyone else around you, although you easily become a figure of great mockery and you don't know it. So sort of good for everyone in that regard, right? Um, there are clearly some pieces there that need to get solved that are mostly technical challenges about whether you can have a fully immersive occluded headset that doesn't produce uh, sort of physiological side effects. There are some, clearly some issues on the content side about what would meaningful content look like in that space and how might you have to rethink storytelling and narrative to deliver something that's compelling and, but also has a kind of a sense of activity and it, it suggests some really different kind of challenges for storytelling. Um, and I think that space is going to be compelling, you know, and, and it's going to be led by the same things it always is led by, gaming and a few other things. So you can imagine that activity is already happening. From where I sit, the stuff that looks in some ways infinitely more interesting because I think it's closer to magic is actually the stuff around augmenting reality, not virtual reality. So what does it mean to start to blend the physical and the virtual and to create experiences that are not just immersive, but that are in some ways, I mean, magic's the best word for it, right? Where it's about a sense of wonder and a sense of excitement. And all the early work I've seen with the pieces that are in that space, so not full immersion, but some middle ground actually look really compelling. But again, I mean, part of the challenge in all of these isn't technical, though there's physiological stuff. It's often about what's the content stream going to be and what's the form factor of the object. Because most of them, again, aren't very good if there's someone else around with you. It's good if you're a single human being, but it's not particularly good if you want to be social. So solving that becomes hugely problematic. Does so anybody have a question for AJ? Or AJ? <clears throat> you know, we actually do make computers still. <laughs> right. Okay, over here. Cool. Uh, good timing. Um, you're adding FPGAs to your CPUs now, and there's a real chasm between running an algorithm and a stored program processor and an FPGA. What are you planning in terms of tools and IP to bridge that gap to allow to hit the mainstream and be useful? Stop me for the next idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're not prepared to answer that yet. Okay. Sorry, we're not prepared to that one. But let's try one more. So I think this is uh, best directed for Stefan. Uh, I'm Chet Polowski from Stratus Technologies. And the question is, as we integrate more and more functions onto the processor, um, does Intel have a vision for uh, replacing the visibility that we've lost when things don't work as expected? We need to figure out what's gone wrong and you know trace transactions. 
is there a plan going forward, especially when we look forward to Cannon Lake? So, yeah, I, I don't think we can talk uh, you know, for Cannon Lake specifics right uh, today. Um, so your, your question, so as we integrating things from the platform, right, I mean sensor apps and everything, how, how do we provide the visibility back, right, I mean we, um, I mean, uh, I wish we had K7, right, I mean talk about that, right? but I mean we have a set of uh, functionalities, right, I mean the, uh, all the USB, uh, well, USB debug, right, I mean all those, you know, we have a, uh, we are uh, looking into uh, an architecture called Hotman that allows you to expose functionality. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is actually we're going to expose that through a USB interface under debug and there are tools that are being created so you have a lot of observability. And all the functions that we're adding like ISP and DSP and sensor hub and everything else there's a development environment so you can actually debug all these uh, capabilities that are at the system level beyond all the CPU stuff. Yeah, so just within each of the IPs, you should have the normal visibility like within USB. What are mechanisms for event tracing and debugging associated with those IPs should exist, right? Now, I suspect the question you're asking is more in terms of the connectivity of all those into the SOC, or? Okay. I think we, uh, through USB, we're going to be able to reflect all the states. And I, I don't know the next level detail, but I've had a fair amount of discussions with the team for all the debug modes. So you can just get it out on USB Type C. There is a special debug mode that, that is being supported. Mm -hmm. So we, we need that debug anyway internally, right? I mean, to be able to debug our internal chips, you know, and so on. We're providing that debug capability also, you know, to OEMs, and so that they can um, debug their own systems, right? Unclosed chassis, so, you know, I use this, uh, anybody, right? All right, we're down to eight minutes. We should have, we, we have six left. Okay, we've got six, six cards. All right, six, six, six questions. Right. Okay, I think the gentleman in the front row here has been speaking uh, pretty patient right. and been trying to, to get a uh, word in. Stand Thank up, you. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Uh, Paul Mooney, Intune Network. I have a manufacturing question. Will Optane be able to retool old fabs, or is Micron and Intel going to have to break ground? Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've announced that we're producing uh, 3D crosspoint which is the media behind Optane uh, in our uh, Lehigh factory uh, in, uh, in Utah. And that's a, uh, a 20,000 wafer start per week main factory today that will be ramping 3D cross point in there. And, you know, as it grows from there, we have options what to do. Go ahead. <clears throat> so I have a question for Ajay. And it relates to USB-C. We know that there's these alternate pins in there, which you can use for anything you want. But the problem is different people want different things on those pins. And it looks like we're facing a situation where some people will have peripheral devices that need those pins to operate in one mode, and Intel and other people will be producing host ports that don't have that mode available. This seems to be shaping up to be a potential disaster, and I'm just wondering how you feel about that. Yeah, anytime you have in, in a spec optional capabilities, people selectively implement what they feel is, uh, you know, useful to them. Now, original intent behind uh, these alternate boards was to sort of allow people to create value-added dock or in two-in-ones, you know, use um, one of the ports as a docking port to your matching peripheral or a dock. People fell in love with this idea and they, you know, expanded the scope and put it on the walk-up connector. So as a part of evolution, um, I'm working on to address this. So as we go forward, I want to see if we can run multiple protocols simultaneously um, 
and really provide scalable, uh, scalable but a uh, single connector that does it all. So you don't have to then distinguish between which connector has uh, which capabilities. So we'll, we'll evolve this back. Okay. And this will be done with our partners in the industry. But not everybody in the industry is your partner. Well, they won't <laughs> realize this. I think most of them are, even though they may not be our customers. Even if you're in a different architecture, the end user problems are the same. And I think, uh, in general, there is agreement that that is a problem. I plug things in. Mm -hmm. the, the current answer is that you get something called billboard. That means you get some sort of pop-up that mm -hmm. says, sorry, this device doesn't work here. And that, that doesn't make for a good experience. As Apple has learned. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll solve it. Okay. Uh, I'm quite aware of this issue. How about the middle and back there? Hello, uh, Paul Quintana from MicroSemi. Uh, just going along the uh, the processor lines, since we haven't had a lot of processor questions, I guess my question would be, uh, what is Intel's plan for creating an embeddable version for third parties to embed IA architecture into uh, SOCs? Your SOC or ours? Uh, our. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, we have anybody here to represent that. Yeah. We need more fellows. <laughs> yeah, we need more fellows. We need a fellow in the medical. I think that should be a case by case because so we do have a case, uh, Sophia line on the embedded uh, uh, space. We work with a particular strategic partner like Rapti. We ask them to uh, deliver the solutions. We work with together. So I think uh, case by case, there will be ways to share the IP, but definitely it's not. Uh, I don't need to expose any more than that uh, already announced. Yeah, Sophia is probably the, the, the salient example today, right? But Sophia is, is an Intel SOC that is being designed by, so it is not exactly, yeah. it's not the question it, that you're asking. It's not quite what he was after, but it's closer to. It's the closest to that. Yeah. Okay, you've been pretty patient on the corner here, like Blue Shirt. Get a question for Carl. Oh yeah, Carl. Uh, thank you, Rich Cluett. Uh This is a data retention question that has system implications. So if you turn off power to something like the Crosspoint technology, how long will the bits uh, stay there? Will it be milliseconds, seconds, days, weeks, months? That question was asked uh, last night in the tech session. It's a non-volatile memory, so it should be lasting for years. Does anybody have a Carl question? How many you got left? One? What exactly oh. do you do, Carl? Two. Two? <laughs> We're not on the slide. Question What's the for worst Carl? decision? Okay, Intel any question goes then. Anyone? All the way in the back. I think, Jim, you've already had one, and so how about we go all the way to the back? So I'll take the guy in the back, and you take the guy in the Who is it? Who's the other one? You raise your hand. Hey, so we'll go back here first. This is for uh, Gen V. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an ultra-high-end user. I fuse enterprise hardware in my desktop system. So my question is, why is Intel so reluctant to unlock a high core count processor to allow people who want to use them in non-critical applications to actually be able to use the full potential of that processor, given the advancement in modern cooling technology today? Did anyone feel free to answer that question? <laughs> that sounds like a skewing question for Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if you got a chance to go to Kirk's, um, and Doug's session yesterday, where they were talking about our case queue, where they're, they're, they were sort of unlocking the CPU and running systems at ungodly speeds. I think I saw something like six point some gigahertz. So. Xeon. So, so yeah. I, I do a little bit of gaming on the side, and, and I overclock my systems at home. Uh, 
And I'd be interested in uh, a machine that went uber super fast also for that same purpose. It's probably some of what you're doing, maybe. Um, I would observe, though, that most of the games that I've taken a look at uh, do not scale well. If you feed them 18 cores, they're not going to be able to use them. Uh, so there's a lot of commercial applications that we spend a lot of time with the ISPs to optimize. So if you're running Photoshop, yeah, okay, that's really going to take advantage. But the gaming world really hasn't caught on to very much more scalability than two, four, six, maybe cores. So uh, I haven't gone pursuing the uh, the ultimate Xeon gaming rig for, for home use yet because the rig is something to go use on. It just announced a product, uh, you know, I don't know the details, but Xeon for laptops. It was just announced. Oh, I don't know the details. You need a big lap. <laughs> okay. So, um, I got the red light here, which means that uh, we have actually run the clock. Um, and there was one more that we had, the young lady right there. Okay. The last question. This is the last question. Bring us on. All right. Um, my question is for Mark. So I think from Haswell to Broadwell, we see the trend where um, if you go with higher core counts, you sacrifice frequency. Is that expected for you know, Skylake and then the future CPUs? Well, I, I'm not sure that is a question for Mark. Uh, that, that is a pro product question, but uh, uh, clearly there, there's a trade-off between uh, you know, how many cores are operating and, and uh, what power the chip will, will consume. So I don't know, maybe some other patents. I mean, the, uh, I mean, on Broadway, we didn't really, really reduce the frequency, right? Because we could always turbo back to the original frequency, right? When you're running fewer cores. So I think that technology, as you know, many of the speakers have been talking about, you know, in the last uh, couple of days, right? I mean, we're planning on keep having so we don't have that frequency inversion moving forward. Okay, I should probably send you guys on to your next gig. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. And, uh,